We're continuing our study in the Gospel of Luke this morning. If you have a Bible, I hope you do. hope you'll open it to Luke chapter 15. We find ourselves in one of the most important chapters of the whole Bible, and we are coming today to one of the most loved parables that Jesus ever spoke. So Luke chapter 15, and we'll be beginning in verse 11. Let me pray for us to begin. Father, we know on the authority of your word, which you have freely given us, that your heart, if we may speak of it so, loves and tends toward love and compassion. You are the Lord, Lord God gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, not fast, abounding in your loyal love, in your faithfulness, and in your truth. Lord, we depend upon all of these things being true of you. Anything else that we think we know in this world can be variable or false or we may be proven wrong in so many areas and yet when it comes to this one thing who you are your heart the sort of God that you are if this is not true then we have nothing and we are lost forever we depend upon your mercy for our very existence and especially for our happiness in the life to come if there's to be any hope for us in our trials and all of the difficulties that we face then That hope springs from this source and no other. It must be you. You are the controller of our destiny. If you are good as you claim to be, then we are in good hands. And if we come humbly to you, if we humble ourselves under your mighty hand, then you exalt us at the proper time and you restore us and you sustain us through every trial, every difficulty, through the very gates of the enemy, you Keep us and preserve us and give us life. So we remember today the character of our God, our creator, the one whom we serve and worship. That you are Yahweh, and that you are good, and that you are the keeper of your people and you receive all who come to you with humility. I pray you'd give us that precious quality of humility that we would become nothing in our own sight, that we might more clearly see you as all and the source of all good. I pray that you would allow your word, which means so much more than any of our small words or the small words that are spoken day by day, any of the words we hear on the news, the words that we say to others and the words we receive from them. Lord, I pray your word would be in bold, would be large, and loud, and we would hear it over the din of all other words, and believe it above all else, because these are your words, and you are God, and we are small, and you are huge, and I pray that you would give us that sense today, that we believe your goodness, believe your word, and stake our eternity upon it. For the sake of your son's name, we pray it. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. In fact, to the humble, God gives salvation. God has decided that he will give happiness, age upon age, unending, to the humble. Now, this is not true of any other category of persons the world over. We can't take any other group of persons characterized by anything and say that this is true of them, these promises of eternal happiness. This is not true of the rich. This is not true of the wise or the foolish. This is not true of the upper class, the middle class, the lower class, the rising class. This is not true of whites or blacks or Hispanics, any ethnic group or nation, the whole world over. There's only one grouping, one category of persons for whom these most important promises prove true, and Scripture says these promises are true for the humble. 
whatever else may be true of a person. Those who labor daily to live upright lives, to keep God's law, for that reason alone, will not see the kingdom of God. Heaven does not belong to the good. Heaven belongs to those who know they are not good and therefore humbly seek God's grace. And for any person who does that, Scripture's promise is clear. God gives grace to the humble. We may wonder why this should be the case. Why should humility over every other possible attribute a person can have be that one thing that wins heaven, that gets eternal happiness? Why has God not yet to this day in all of history turned away one humble sinner who has come knocking at his door? There have been presidents and prime ministers, kings and emperors who have knocked at heaven's door and have been turned away, but not one low life who has come with true humility has ever been turned away from the paradise of God. And we may wonder why that would be, and the answer is because unlike any other characteristic you may have, humility and humility alone gives to God the glory that He deserves. For you to ask God to accept you for anything else, save because you are pretty good morally, is a slap in the face of God's honor. And that for two reasons. One, because for any of us to come to God and say, you should allow us into paradise because we've been pretty good, is to demean God's goodness. Because that means we think that we are in some way approximate to that goodness. That we are in some way at least close to the goodness and the purity and the holiness of God. Yet God knows from His heavenly perspective when He looks upon the sons of mankind that our goodness is like filthy rags. That our highest goodness, our best days of the most holy, righteous person ever to live on this earth aside from the perfect Christ our goodness is almost pure and unfiltered evil compared to the majesty of God's purity. So that if we come to God and say, let us into heaven because we're pretty good, it's really to demean His goodness and think it less than it is. But secondly, to come to God and think that we could get to heaven not by humbly accepting His grace, but proudly asserting our own good qualities makes little of God's saving work. This would be as though you were held captive in the Middle East and a special operations unit. The, the military came to rescue you and it cost a large number of lives as this military team broke through enemy forces and found you. And it's as if you in that moment should look at them, battle wearied and say, you didn't have to go through all that trouble. I could have taken care of myself. Christ came to earth as a sort of special operations to rescue sinners and for any person to then turn around to Christ and say, you didn't really have to go through all that trouble because I'm pretty good morally. Or some other characteristic is to demean God's glory in the work that He has accomplished through Christ to rescue sinners. Humility is the one thing necessary, the one thing God requires. And as we're continuing our study in the Gospel of Luke, we're coming here to chapter 15. We're partway through one of the, if not the, best known, most loved parables in the entire Bible is what we're looking at today. And the point of the parable, above all other things, is to teach us to love humility. Because humility and humility alone receives the Father's embrace. So let's look at this text. Luke chapter 15, we're beginning in verse 11. And Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of property that's coming to me. And 
he, the father, divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless, prodigal living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So, he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let's eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. And he was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father's killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Although we call this parable, the parable of the prodigal son, it's really about two sons. It's not about one son. It's about a younger prodigal boy, and it's also about his older and his respectable, respectable brother. Now, you may recall from last week that Luke chapter 15 is a series of three parables, and they all have a similar, almost the same theme. There was a sheep that was lost, it was found, and there was rejoicing. There was a coin that was lost, it was found, and there was rejoicing. And here there is a son that was lost, he's found, and there's rejoicing. Yet in this case, it's expanded upon because there is the older brother as well, who represents the Pharisees. The reason the older brother needs to be in this parable is because this is part of the purpose of these three parables. These parables began, if you remember, because of an event in verses 1 and 2. 
which says, now the tax collectors and sinners, prodigal sons, if you will, were all drawing near to hear Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes, older brother, if you will, grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. He kills the fattened calf for the prodigal. So this parable of the prodigal son is yet one more answer to the complaint that the Pharisees have given against Jesus. And so, we get this parable. This is a parable, as I said, of two sons, and so that's the way that we're going to follow this parable today. We're going to begin with the younger son, because that's where the parable begins, but then it moves on to the older son. And the point of all again in both cases with the younger and the older son is to teach us to love humility because that's what saves the younger son and that alone is what can save the older. So let's begin where the text begins, which is with the younger son whom we call traditionally the prodigal. The term prodigal, it's an older term we don't use very much anymore. It just means one who lives their life with a sort of recklessness and wastefulness, a lack of self-control, and that will describe this younger son. If you look at his behavior again in verses 11 through 13, there was this man, the father had two sons, and the younger of them, the prodigal, said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. Don't make me wait. Give it to me now. And he, the father, divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. Now, in the rest of this parable, it's very clear that the father still owns at least some of his own property, so we may wonder how is it that he has already given it to his son. Most likely what's happened is this. In that day, the oldest son, if there's two boys, gets two-thirds of the inheritance, two-thirds of the property, whereas the younger would get one-third. So the father has most likely taken one-third of the property and given it as a share to his son who's asked him for it. The father still retains possession in some technical sense, but the son has it as a share. And what he can do with that share is go and find someone to buy that share ahead of time who is willing to wait until the father dies. And when the father dies, one-third of the property will go to that person. The son obviously had to liquidate his assets in some way because it says he goes to a far country. He can't take all his property with him to this country. So probably that's what he's done, sold his share, one-third of the property. It could have taken generations to build up whatever wealth this father owns. This could have been generations working diligently in the field to get to this point and in just one moment one reckless son shatters the inheritance sells one third takes the money and goes to a far country the young son doesn't mind because he only has one thing on his mind and that's himself it's the immediate experience of pleasure for himself. He's willing to break up the legacy of his own lineage for the sake of that pleasure. He casts his family, his father, his brother, everything behind him. And to ask his father for this inheritance, as you've probably heard before, especially in that culture, would likely be a very dishonoring to the father, as if to say, I wish you were already dead so that I could have your wealth. He's willing to do all of this why? The motive is given very clearly in verse 13. He takes a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. In verse 30, his older brother will say that he devoured the property with prostitutes, and that is probably accurate. 
this young man is a partier. The whole force of his life is cast in the direction of immediate experience of pleasure. So translated into today, here's a young man who has moved to a big city. If you want to find him, you will go to the nicest clubs. You will find him wearing the nicest clothes, accompanied always by some young woman of less than pristine principles, smelling always of alcohol, weed, or other substances. He's not working a job, obviously, because that's not pleasurable to him. He has this big fat cash cow that's come from the third of his father's property that he sold in advance, and he is living the life. To him, this is the life. And yet we're given something of heaven's perspective when we look at the best description of this life given in the whole parable, and it's from the Father, who in verse 24 and again in 32, we'll say, this my son was dead. Or again, this my son was lost. This younger son, this prodigal, is dead. He looks alive. In fact, he looks like he's living his best life now. But the father's right. He's dead. He's dead spiritually. He's dead to God. He's dead to everything that really matters. He has no spiritual sensitivity. He's much like an animal. An animal doesn't think very far ahead. An animal is looking for immediate gratification of natural desires. And that's what this man is doing. This is not life. This is death. He's dead to his father. He's dead to his family, which is the father's main point in saying he was dead. This young man feels like he's finally made it, like he's finally found. He's in the big city. He's enjoying himself. And yet the father says he's lost. He's not found. He's lost to everything that's good. He's lost to everything that's right, everything that's meaningful in life. He's far from all of that. He's wandering out there lost. And if... This prodigal at this point was to continue in this path unchecked. He would, like so many people, live his life to the full, seeking immediate pleasures and then slip unnoticed, almost, into an eternity of torment for his offenses against God and others. But he does not go unchecked. God intervenes in the parable with a kindness. And the kindness is, according to our text, a severe famine. That might not look like a kindness. Many of God's kindnesses don't look like kindness on the surface. But for any person who is running madly at a dash toward hell and an eternity of suffering, for God to intervene with anything that would shake such a person from that sort of slumber toward death, even a famine, that is kindness. And in fact, in our text, it's a double kindness because just at the time when the famine comes, his cash cow is gone. He has run out of his money, the text tells us. Verse 14 on reads as follows. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Best thing that could happen to him. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. These pigs are probably eating carob pods, which are not naturally digestible to humans, and yet that's the point this boy has gotten to where he's willing to even try that, or maybe to grind it into a powder or something. He's desperate. You can see his desperation because Jesus is presenting him here very clearly at the very bottom of the barrel. This is as bad as it can get. You see that because he's in a foreign land, this citizen that he's hired himself out to, probably almost a sort of slavery, he hires himself out to the citizen. This is a Gentile. This is not a Jewish person. And you see that again because he's raising pigs. And to the Jewish people, the pig is an unclean animal. You don't eat a pig. You don't have pigs. And yet here, 
he's washing a stranger's pigs and being paid so little that in the famine he has nothing to eat. He wishes he could eat the food the pigs are eating. The unclean pigs are in a better state than this young man is. That's the presentation Jesus gives of him. This is the lowest low, and he's hungry, and probably the saddest conclusion, the saddest part is the conclusion in verse 16 at the end, and no one gave him anything. And that is so sad, because only a few verses before, his father gave him everything, up to a third of his kingdom for the son that he loved. His father loved him, cared for him, ensured an inheritance for him, and when he asked, gave him one third of all he had to sell to go throw away that money. But now, having left his father, no one cares. You might be right now, almost certainly some of you are right now, in the pigsty with the prodigal. This is where you are. God has brought you or is bringing you, if he's expressing his kindness in this moment towards you, he's bringing you, not just to a low place, but to the lowest possible place, either through internal emotion or the circumstances of your life, or hopefully both of them, bringing you to the very bottom. You may have, for some time past, been living life in a way that seems right to you. Scripture says there is a way that seems right to a man or to a woman, and you have possibly lived that way. You've sought immediate pleasures, or you've sought the approval of others, and you've invested your whole life in those things. You have done things perhaps you thought you never would do, and that's the way that you've been living your life, compromise after compromise, until you've kind of given yourself over to whatever poison you have picked, whatever sort of sin appeals to your fancy, and you're living your life that way, and if God is kind to you, He will bring a severe famine, and hopefully it will be just when your resources run out, and hopefully it will cast you into a pigsty, into the mud to crave the carob pods with the swine. There's nothing kinder God could do. And that may be, in fact, where you find yourself right now. Scripture says that sin, its pleasures are fleeting pleasures, that they do not last. They may even last this whole lifetime. They won't last one second longer. But for most, God expresses His kindness in cutting them short even in this life by making the bread turn bitter even while it's being chewed, by turning the sin into wormwood. And that may be you, and now you may feel yourself too far removed from the country whence you came, too far from the father you left. You have wasted his resources, you have left God, you have offended him day after day, and heaven you think is for nice, clean, polite people who live nice, clean, polite lives, and that's certainly not you. Then what hope do you have? Just to continue living yourself in this unfruitful and miserable sort of life, and then slip into an eternity of punishment? This parable says otherwise. If you're in the same condition of the prodigal, then you're about to watch this prodigal in your very condition walk through the doorway of salvation. It is a doorway that requires of him only one thing. He's not going to clean up his whole life. He's not going to earn back the third that is wasted. That is gone forever. He's going to do one thing, and he'll be welcomed back heartily by the Father. And if you don't believe me, you don't have to. Let me just show you in the text what he does and the reception he gets afterward. Look again back to the story, verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants, his day laborers, have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. This is the doorway 
to complete forgiveness, a clearing of whatever your past record may be, a washing away of the mud of the pigsty, a full acceptance by the Father, an eternity of paradise. All of this is on the other side of this doorway, and this doorway is humility. Some will call it faith. They go together. It is a one side of faith. It is repentance. It is humbly accepting and acknowledging your own fault. Notice especially what you do not find in the son's reasonings. There is not there one excuse. There is not one instance of blame shifting. There is instead just this very simple and clear statement, I have sinned. No one gets to heaven without coming to that conclusion first. That's humility. Pride will never say that. Pride does not want to say that. Pride may offer that with concessions about, well, it's my parents and my parents' parents and it's my brain mechanics and it's this certain disorder that I have and it's some hormones and it's something else and it's what this person did to me. That's pride and it may have a confession of sin hidden amid the excuses and God wants nothing to do with that because he opposes the proud. Humility is exactly what the prodigal son expresses when he simply says, I have sinned against God, against heaven, and before others, before my father, recognizing my problem. I'm the problem, not them. I'm the problem. I sinned. I erred. I sold the money. I wasted it. And now, he says, he will go back to his father, not expecting full reinstatement as a beloved son, but saying, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And when he says that, he's 100% right. That's humility. That's the doorway through which you can enter into paradise. There is no other door. The difficulty is that a person can pray a prayer, say a prayer, sign a card, raise a hand, respond to an altar call, or do all sorts of things without really having this humility. And in those cases, the outward motions mean nothing to God. God looks at the heart. And when he looks at the heart, this is what he's looking for, a brokenness over sin. The text says insightfully that the young man comes to himself. We thought he was already at himself because spatially, how can it be otherwise? But that's an expression to say he was out of his mind. He was living in sin like an animal and he finally comes to himself acknowledges by a gift of God's grace his own error before God, his own bestial, animalistic way of life, and now he can confess to God with no excuse, I'm the sinner, have mercy on me. And he says, I will arise, I will go to my father. When he says this, we transition in our text to the most incredible and precious part of the whole parable. The one part maybe you remember most if you're familiar with this parable in its beginning in verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let's eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. One reason that humility gets entrance into the Father's heart in a way nothing else does, is that humility makes God's righteous wrath against your sin no longer necessary. So long as any stubborn sinner resists God in pride, resists the humbling of the heart, he is like some 
wooden board stood upright with a heavy weight upon it, pulling down God's righteousness, pushing against it, and the wood is bowing, bowing, and any moment to snap. But the moment that wooden board lays down flat in humility, you can put as much weight as you want on it, and it is fine. The same proved true of any sinner, so long as the sinner stubbornly persists against God with excuses and desire to continue after sin, that board will bend. But once the sinner gives up, once the sinner stops kicking against the goad behind him or her, then immediately the wrath of God is gone. Humility was the only thing necessary. Humility doesn't clear your sins or atone for the wrongs that you have done. Christ has done that upon the cross. He suffered the punishment for those who have humility. But humility is our access to that. Christ died for the humble. He died for those who will accept the gift that he's extending, not those who smack the hand or say, I'm pretty good, I don't need the help or the handout. Christ paid the penalty on Calvary, but it is the moment that you humble yourself before God, like this prodigal, that you experience forgiveness. You experience the benefit of Christ's death, that his blood is wiped over your door. God would rather receive the sinner with all the joy of the Father in this parable. That's why this is a precious parable, because that Father, Jesus, has specifically designed in the parable to represent God. He's saying, this is what God's heart is like. Whatever you may think it is, this is what it is, just like in the previous parables. And as soon as there's repentance, as soon as he sees the Son in the distance, the Father throws caution to the wind, runs to his Son. That's the heart of God toward you. Whatever you've done, or whoever you are, the moment you come to yourself, the moment you stop kicking the goad, the moment you are a long way off on your way, the Father wishes to run to you and throw His arms around your neck and receive you back. That's the heart of God. He brings out in this parable a ring puts it on the son, maybe with a signet of the family to say you are reinstated as a son, you're not a slave, puts the best robe, not any robe, but the best robe upon him, sandals on his feet because poor pauper that he is, he probably only has mud on his feet at this point, kills the fattened calf, forget the carob pods, this is an immense celebration, a fattened calf would feed many people, this is a party. This is a party better than any that the prodigal son had experienced in that far land. There is joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And all of this is happening because he humbled himself. Precisely the same can be said of you this moment if you humble yourself. Look, it doesn't matter if you have nice garments to bring with you. The prodigal didn't. The moment you humble yourself before God, acknowledge your sin before Him and stop blaming others and accept that you've done the wrong before God, the Father has a robe of righteousness He would love to throw around you. Are you ashamed of your bare feet caked with mud from the pigsty? He has sandals He would like to give you. You don't need to purchase any. He will give you a ring. You're ashamed because of your emptiness and your hunger and your growling stomach because you have sought out cisterns that leak and cannot satisfy you, bread that does not satisfy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've sought out in the past. You come to the Father and He will kill the fattened calf. You will be feasting tonight if you humble yourself. You're ashamed because all your former companions who seemed so friendly to you when you had a lot of money and you were interested in the things they were interested in you in that far city. They all abandoned you the moment the well dried up. And you're ashamed of that. It doesn't matter. You come to the Father and you'll be in an embrace warmer than any you've known. Give glory to God. Because if you humble yourself, that's exactly what you're doing. You're saying that you believe He'll embrace you. You believe He's good. You disbelieve your doubts about that and everything the devil whispers, and you believe that he is a good father who desires for you to come back. You come to him in humility with nothing else, 
and he'll supply everything. He'll supply your righteousness. He'll supply your forgiveness. He'll give you eternal life. He'll give you joy and purpose now and life into eternity. He'll supply it. Don't think you have to get it to come to him. You come fresh from the pigsty, still stinking, and he'll receive you, wash you, clean you, feed you. That's the point of the parable when it comes to the younger son. So we've seen the younger son now, but as I said, this parable is not just about the younger son. Jesus is also interested in presenting the older son, and it's to the older son we now turn. This is the older brother. This is, after all, from Jesus' point of view, a response to the Pharisees who grumbled that he received sinners. So he's giving an answer by presenting the Pharisees, it seems, as this older brother brother. The sinners are the younger brother that Jesus receives, and the Pharisees are like this older brother. This really is, in a sense, the parable's final desperate attack on your pride, trying to kill your pride. Some people have a pride in a base way of life, and they are like the younger son that need to come to themselves and leave that animalistic way of life. But there are others who have a more respectable self-righteous sort of pride, which will damn someone to hell just as well as the former. And so Jesus now will attack that kind of pride that he sees in the Pharisees out of love for them so that they too might humble themselves. So look at the older brother here, beginning in verse 25. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother's come and your father's killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Now we can see from the very start of this section on the older brother, that he is, in all respects, dutiful. Where is he at the very beginning of his entrance, beginning of his entrance in this parable? He's coming from the field. While the younger son is out prodigaling away in a self-pleasing manner in a far country, this older son has been in the field. He says, in fact, verse 29, look, these many years... I've served you, Father, and never disobeyed your command. For many years in the field, in the heat of the day, laboring dutifully, never disobeying at least the letter of his Father's commands. If the Father says, do this, he does it. He's not the one who's running away, wasting his wealth on prostitutes. This is the dutiful son. He's keeping the law of his Father. And you may wonder why then the parable casts this son in a negative light. He seems to be very obedient, very good, really a pretty good son. But there's one thing that he lacks. He has so many things going for him and this one thing he lacks, humility. The older son is proud. How do we know that? You see it seeping through every action and every word he speaks in his brief part of this passage. Yes, he's keeping the Father's law. He is out working in the field, which we might also add will one day be his field, so there's a reason to be working there besides obeying his Father. But nonetheless, he's keeping his Father's law. But where is his heart? His heart is not his father's heart. 
Because when his brother returns, his father's heart opens in a generous, accepting love of the son. Because this father genuinely loves this younger son. And therefore, when the son comes, the father's heart is obvious. But when the son comes, the brother's heart is also obvious. Whatever the brother may say, however dutiful he may appear outwardly, just like the Pharisees or any religious person Sunday after Sunday sitting in the pew, whatever the look, whatever the appearance, whatever the external observation of law, whatever the appearance of obedience, the concern with this man, this older brother, is under the ribcage. It is in his heart. You see that in his response to the brother. It says he's angry that the brother came home. We imagine he would rather the brother stayed away. He would rather maybe the brother died than to come home and cause this horrible embarrassment. Then that he should have a fattened calf killed from him. And what this shows us is that in the end, in this world which is in many ways divided between those type of people who love to indulge in those baser, lower, animalistic sorts of sins which are obvious to the world and which we all tisk at and turn our noses up against, and those who live the more respectable sins, those who attend church or synagogue or what have you, and live an outwardly nice and decent life, but inwardly are like wolves or dead bones. That in the end, those two groups, though they seem so far separate, are really one and the same. Because what is it that the older son is most interested in? Himself. His pleasures take a different form, but he's thinking about himself. Just like the younger son whose sight was so narrowly fixed upon himself, he couldn't see the damage he was doing now. Here's the older son with his sight so fixed upon himself, he can't see the bigger picture, which the father sees, which is that his brother was dead and he's alive and we should celebrate. It's necessary to celebrate, but the brother looking at himself only thinks, I didn't even get a goat. A petty self-righteous thought because a goat or a fattened calf one small one large both are grace neither are deserved but this proud brother thinks it is deserved and that's why he's offended because humble people like the prodigal son when he comes to himself say I'm not even worthy and proud people say I deserve the fattened calf now the father graciously comes out and in his conclusion and the conclusion to this message, he comes to this older son, representing the Pharisees and all religious proud persons the world over, and he offers these closing lines which give the main thrust of the whole message. He says, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. We might wonder how those words could apply to the Pharisees if they represent the older brother. All, I, all that is mine is yours because they actually needed to repent or they wouldn't receive the inheritance. But that's a detail of the parable that's not of great importance and may not connect directly in the way we think that it should. And it doesn't matter because the emphasis of the parable is not there. The emphasis is past there, really on this one statement. This summarizes the whole thing. Everything Jesus has been saying in all of Luke chapter 15 is in this phrase, it was fitting to celebrate and have joy. Brothers and sisters, wherever you are watching this, may God graciously grant us to have this heart, not of the older brother. May he spare us that. May he give us this heart of the Father that we would crave that any sinner anywhere, no matter how much they've wronged us, no matter how horribly they've treated us, if they've persecuted us and slandered us and thought ill of us, that we would crave just as much as this wronged father when that one prodigal repents to run 
and to embrace and to kiss and to welcome and to lavish with blessing and to welcome into the kingdom of God. What do we have that we've not received? Let us not be the older brother pouting outside about petty little things that God's not giving us enough grace and us enough attention and we've worked so hard to earn it and those sinners have not. Nobody earns it. This is grace. Nobody earns it. We're in the same boat with anyone. We are all sinners. And may that then compel us. May the love that we felt in that embrace, you remember that? When God first embraced you into his family, no matter how dirty or filthy you were coming to him, and he ran and he embraced you, that feeling must in us compel the desire to see that same feeling extended to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family, every last one of them, and to the nations of the earth who live out there in pigsties, who have no one to give them anything. May God use us to give them something, to give them the warmth of the Father's embrace by not like the older son pouting outside, not willing to come in, forget that, but going out in a humility to seek the son who's gone out waywardly and prodigally, throwing away life to seek, even to seek and to save the lost and to urge them, as I urge you now in closing, that you would come to yourself, humble yourself, and go back home because the Father is waiting and He will receive you. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'd Show the power of your word by using this appeal to bring even one prodigal home. You desire our life, not our death. Our well-being, not our calamity. You desire that for every prodigal. And I plead, Lord, that you would even now grant a coming to oneself for someone who hears these words believing that you will supply everything necessary on the other side of that doorway of humility. Just pray they would bend low to make the low threshold to enter in to your kingdom. Lord, I pray too for any who are on the Pharisee side of things, proud and critical and harsh and cruel and selfish in their own way, which was my lot as well. Lord, I pray for them to come home to enter in, not to stand outside, not to be the first who is last, but the last who's first. I pray they would humble themselves before you. I pray that you would fill every valley and lower every mountain, that you alone might be exalted, that you would break the pride of man, and that you would exalt the name of your Son who came to save sinners. In Jesus' name we pray.